Well, good morning. And I was thinking this week about the summer of 1980. You know, I was 16 years of age and I was working every summer in my grandmother's farm in County Mayo. And she didn't have a phone. And I remember this well because if we wanted to make a call, we had to walk about 10 minutes to a nearby farm, which was called Cusick's, and we'd ring home from there. And that particular summer, I made that journey one night to ring home to get my O-level results. Do you remember those? Now, I remember walking back afterwards and it was the most gorgeous sunset and the sun was setting just at the end of the road. Now, this is well before the days of mobile phones, so I couldn't take a photograph. And, uh, and I really was uh, pondering as I walked back on my results because uh, as it turned out, I got good results right across the board, except in one subject where I got a very low mark. Guess what the subject was? <laughs> Religious education. That's God's sense of humor, isn't it? He takes the things that are not, the foolish things. I remember actually writing a postcard back to my mother that week, joking that uh, she would have to give up her plans for me to become the next Pope. Now, does anyone remember the days of writing postcards and letters? You know, somewhere in our attic, there are a pile of uh, letters that Nicola and I wrote to each other when we were dating. And um, well, I guess nowadays, rather than letters stored in the attic, people would have emails stored in the cloud. I don't know if other people uh, read such letters. We haven't actually reread the letters, but it was just that they seemed too precious to throw away. You know, I still remember the excitement of getting a letter from Nicola. Here was someone who I could totally be myself with. And through knowing her and experiencing her love for me, I was experiencing life to be sweeter than I'd ever known it to be. And I was discovering that there was an abundance to this thing called life that I'd never known before. Now, do you know that the life that God has always wanted for you and I is something sweeter and more abundant than we've ever known in this world? You know, Jesus said it like this in John 10, 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Or as one version says, that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Now, last week I said that us attempting to find life through what we do leaves us looking to ourselves for life. And I called that eating from the self-effort tree. And we saw that real life, the life that God has for us, is not to be found through doing the right things, but through knowing the right person, knowing the Father through the Son. And we saw that according to John 17, 3, that is in fact Jesus' definition of eternal life, God's quality of life. To know the Father through knowing Jesus is to partake of the tree of life. Now let me say that in a different way. There is no greater life, more abundant life, a man or a woman can live than to live believing that God is your Father. And for this, we have Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Now, down through the generations, because we live in a self-centered world, every generation of the church has been influenced to a greater or lesser degree by that self-centeredness uh, spirit of the world, uh, that man-centered spirit of the world, even in the way we express the gospel. You know, the unrenewed mind of man can't help inflating his role in his own salvation. In other words, we can't help trying to justify ourselves. So although the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, clearly taught that we're all saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, so that no man can boast, guess what? In every generation, we still manage to somehow slip our own wee bit of self-effort into the gospel just enough to boast and therefore just enough to cause division in the body of Christ. It seems Paul was right. Every generation since the Galatians can't help leavening the gospel with a little yeast, a little something to make ourselves rise up. And he was right also to point out that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Now, you won't find Christians today who say what the Galatians said, that we're saved by grace and salvation is not of ourselves, it's all of God, except that little thing that you have to do called circumcision. That's your part. No, people don't say that anymore. These days instead, you'll find Christians everywhere believing that we're saved by grace and salvation is not of yourselves, 
is all of God, except that little thing you have to do called repentance. That's your part. Are you sorry enough? And have you confessed enough to be truly saved? Or even, are you being sorry enough? And are you consistently still confessing enough to remain saved? But there is a problem with that belief. Have you noticed it yet? No one can ever tell you exactly how much is enough. Whenever we introduce a little leaven into the gospel, just a little thing we have to do ourselves, no one can ever tell you how much is enough. Let's ask the question in a different way. What does real repentance look like? Does it look like never doing the sort of unsavory things you did before you were saved ever again? Or does repentance look like doing them sometimes, but always making sure you confess that you've done them and asking for forgiveness? But how many times can you keep that up, confessing and repenting, before it isn't real repentance at all? And what happens if I forget to confess some of the things that I've done? I mean, how much confession is enough? How much repentance is enough? How much faith is enough? How much obedience is enough? So what do we do with this question, how much is enough? Well, before I tell you the church's response down the generations to the question, how much is enough? Let me first tell you the Father's response that comes by the Spirit. And it's a good Jewish response. He simply says this, Enough already. Enough already. Now, enough already even has a name. Christ. He is enough already. And what I'm going to show you today is that in every generation, when the gospel has become leavened with a little law, there comes a time for the church to say, Enough already. Christ. But until it does, the church always handles this question in a different way. This question of how important in our salvation is the little thing that we have to do. We simply divide and divide again and again until we are 10,000 different factions, each with our own version of the little thing that we have to do in order to be truly saved. Some say you have to say a prayer that sounds like this. Others say, no, you have to do that and be baptized. Others say, no, you have to be baptized and continue to partake of the sacraments of the church. Others say, no, even if you do all that and you don't keep doing that right to the end of your life, then you probably weren't even saved in the first place. Can you see the problem? To the question, how much is enough? The church doesn't say enough already and point to Christ. She tends to say not enough already and point to you. Now, what was Paul's answer to this question? How much is enough? What was his response when he came across the church in Corinth beginning to divide into factions? What did the Holy Spirit inspire him to write to those who'd started to divide the church into followers of Apollos or Peter or Paul? I want you to listen to the Holy Spirit's response to the question, how much is enough? How much of my confession, my repentance, my obedience, my faith is needed for my salvation? 1 Corinthians 3 verse 11. No one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. You see, the foundation for our salvation is the life of Christ, his life and his work. Full stop. I'll say it again. The foundation of our salvation is the life of Christ, his life, his work. Full stop. The foundation of our salvation is not Christ's life for me plus my response, my confession, my repentance, my obedience, or my faith. That would be to put the tiniest weakness into that pure foundation of Christ alone. And whenever anyone in 2000 years of church history has laid even a tiny bit of you or I, our self-life, that mixture, that weakness into the foundational beliefs of the church, it has always resulted in a crack, a division appearing in the building, the church. You know, when any good builder sees cracks appearing all over a building, the first question he will ask is, what is the foundation of this building? If I tell you that your salvation is 99.999% Jesus' work and only 0.0001% yours, does that bring you into complete rest over your salvation? No, because how can you ever be sure you've done your 0.001%? 
You see, you've been led right back to how much is enough, the self-effort tree. That little thing that you have to do will keep your hope on yourself and you will never be free from yourself and so never be free from the selfish life. Now, I'm not saying that believing that you played a part in your salvation means that you're not saved. I'm saying that believing that you have a part to play in your salvation, even the tiniest part, will keep you chained to the self-effort tree all your life. You will live a religious, self-conscious life, and it is difficult for the world to see the light of Christ in you and I when it is hidden under a bowl called self. It's hard to run straight and true when you're running with your eyes on yourself. Now, in case you might be thinking, Phelan doesn't seem to think repentance is an essential part of salvation, let me say something very clearly. Repentance is an essential part of salvation. But now listen to the gospel again from Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, which declares that salvation is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. How can you truly believe your salvation is the gift of God and not of yourself if you keep taking credit for the repentance part yourself? How can you truly believe your salvation is the gift of God and not of yourself if you keep taking credit for the repentance part yourself? Now you're thinking, but failing repentance was my part, wasn't it? I mean, because I repented. Well, I could ask you what you mean by repentance and probably find that you will talk about things that you no longer do, whereas the repentance in the Bible is actually the Greek word metanoia, which refers to something much deeper than a change in what you're doing, but a profound change in how you're being, how you're perceiving life itself. But let's put all that aside and just say that you repented. Yes, you repented, but you did not repent by yourself. It was not yourself alone that somehow worked up the strength and the willpower from within your own soul to repent. The gospel says quite clearly that it is impossible for a man to repent apart from God. Listen to 1 Corinthians 12, 3. No man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Listen to Jesus say this in John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless... The Father who sent me draws them. In other words, no person can repent apart from the work of God's Spirit. Repentance is not a matter of our willpower, <clears throat> but rather of our wills empowered by the Holy Spirit. And that very power comes to you through the gospel that lifts up Christ as your salvation, not your repentance. Give me a gospel that leaves my hope resting in the sure foundation of Christ and his work, and you will leave me with my eyes on him and living life with my eyes on him, living life in his presence. That's metanoic. It brings a profound repentance into my life, a change of mind that moves me from the center of my life and puts him there. But if you give me a gospel that keeps pointing me to my repentance and inferring that it better be good enough, well, that may sound passionate and zealous for God and make for great revival preaching, but what you're doing is pointing me to me, not to Christ. Don't point me to my obedience. Point me to Christ's. Don't point me to my faith. Point me to Christ's. Don't point me to my life for him. Point me to his life for me. Christ, don't ask me if I'm doing enough. Tell me enough already. Christ, tell me the gospel. Don't let some fiery, passionate preacher on repentance simply lead you back to eat of the self-effort tree rather than to partake of the tree of life. Now, how do you know if that's what's happening in your life? Well, are you ready for this? No matter how many times you hear the gospel, you can't seem to he help hearing it as good advice, not good news. That's how you know. No matter how many times you hear the gospel, you can't seem to help hearing it as good advice, not good news. You see, that's always been the response to the gospel of a people brought up under the law. You know, on hearing Jesus, many people, the response was, yes, but. Listen to John 6 and verse 28. On hearing Jesus, the people's response was, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. 
Now, can you hear what he is doing? He is lifting their eyes off themselves and onto him. How do you know you're hearing the gospel? What you hear lifts your vision up, up off your life for God and onto God's life for you, Christ. No matter how eloquent or passionate or biblical a message sounds, no matter how much the preacher was weeping or how many people ran to the front, ask yourself this, did what I just hear leave my hope on Christ or on me? Now, if it left your hope on you, I guarantee you that when that preacher comes back next year to preach the same message, you'll be down the front weeping again because nothing much will have changed in your life through the year. Because as long as preachers are leaving your hope on yourself, there'll be no power in your life to change because the power of God that brings the greatest change is the profound thanksgiving that only comes to a heart that has been persuaded that Christ is enough. A heart at rest. A heart at rest is one no longer being driven into self-effort by the question, how much is enough? Because they've been led to the tree of life, not the tree of self-effort, and led there by the message, enough already, Christ. You know, years ago, someone told me how they train elephants to work in the forests of the Far East. I mean, how can those massive, powerful creatures be controlled just by a little man with a small stick sitting on their back? Well, apparently when the elephant is very young, they tie it up to a tree with a very strong chain. And no matter how hard the elephant pulls on the chain, it can't break free. And after some time, the elephant, with their great memories, they become so persuaded, so convinced that they cannot escape, that over the years it becomes possible to tie them to that tree with flimsier and flimsier cords, until eventually you have a giant, powerful creature tied to a tree with a piece of string and never moving. Sit in church long enough under a thousand messages that infer that God gives you his life on the basis of your repentance, your obedience, your faith, and eventually you'll be so sin conscious and self conscious that you can't go into all the world and love them as they are. You can only live a life that revolves around you and your work for God because you're tied to the self effort tree and you're living a life more conscious of your life for God than his life for you and his life in you. In short, you aren't living life in the presence of God for you're too busy living life in the presence of yourself. You aren't living life in the presence of God because you're too busy living life in the presence of yourself. You know, when the life I'm living as a Christian is born more from seeing myself as of the flesh than as of the spirit, then I find myself grasping for life. Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael, and they were a picture of these two types of life. Ishmael was the life that came from Abraham's flesh, and Isaac was the life that came by the moving of God's spirit. When Abraham finally realized that God's blessing and purposes would be outworked through Isaac and not Ishmael, he cried out to God for Ishmael. And what he said of him gives us a profound insight into the difference between living according to the flesh and according to the spirit. The authorized version says that Abraham cried out to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. But listen to that same verse from the International Standard Version. If only Ishmael would live in constant awareness that you're always with him. Isn't that beautiful? You know, when I've been sitting under the law rather than the gospel, I inevitably find myself looking to myself instead of living life in the constant awareness that he is always with me. Instead of living life in the presence of God, I find I'm too busy living life in the presence of myself. You know, perhaps for God's spirit, that must feel something like being out for the evening with the person you love, and they're spending the whole evening using their phone to take selfies of every little thing they do to post for the whole world to instantly see. It feels like they aren't living in your presence, but in the presence of the world, a world that is measuring them by their appearance, you know, to many of us, we have spent years living in the presence of the church who appears to be constantly measuring us by our appearance, the appearance of holiness, rather than living in the presence of him who says, enough already, Christ is your holiness, be free from your selfie life. The thanksgiving that comes as our minds are renewed to rest entirely in Christ and his life 
will cause us, you know, to be holier by accident than we ever were on purpose. It's, it's the strangest paradox, but the most unholy life to God is the one that is totally focused on itself. That's why self-effort, religion, is not the way to holiness. Thanksgiving is. And the gospel of your obedience can never fill you with a thanksgiving that the gospel of his grace can. I find when I live more aware of my life for him than his life in me, then no matter how many times I hear the gospel, I can't seem to help hearing it as good advice instead of good news. Good advice is like earthly food. Within a day we're hungry again. Good news is heavenly food. It brings a transformation into our life that only thanksgiving can bring. As long as we think our salvation depends on ourselves, even to the smallest degree, that little lie will tether us to the self-effort tree and we'll never know the transformational level of thanksgiving in our life that comes from letting Jesus save us to the uttermost. For when he saves us, he's not content to leave us to ourselves. He lifts your life into his so that you can live in his presence today, not one day when you have repented for long enough. Church, enough already. Christ. Why is this important? Because this living in his presence today, that's nothing short of our witness to this world. For we're called to be witnesses that Jesus is alive. And the best way to be such a witness is to be with Jesus every day. Right from the earliest days of the church, only those who had been with Jesus lived lives of such boldness that the world had to take note. People who live in the presence of God live differently to people who live in the presence of the world. And that difference is seen in our thanksgiving in all circumstances. Now we'll come back to that. Let's get back to where we began. Jesus' statement in John 10, 10. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it abundantly. Now this living in the presence of God, or as Paul described it to the Colossians, you died and your life now is hidden with Christ and God. You know, to live a life that now is in the presence of God, this is the abundant life that Jesus said he came that we might have. You know, I just took a little detour there for 10 minutes to show you how much religion can steal this life from you. Life as God knows life is not an I activity. It has always been an us activity. Life to God is not a singular activity, but it is living in the presence of those you love. Life to God is not doing. It is being together with. Now, we each already have some experience of that truth in this life. You know, I remember again, right back to that night when I was 16, getting those exam results. That was a big event in my young life. But what I remember is the sweetest part of that event, the abundance of that event, that life was found in sharing that news, that event with my family. Has that not been the case for all the major events of your life? And when you think back on things that have happened to you in this life, are not the most memorable moments, the sweetest moments, the ones that you shared with your loved ones? And are not the most painful moments you had in life, those of being deprived of that experience, of being able to share life with a loved one, of being no longer able to live in their presence? Let's say tomorrow you discover that you have won a seven day all expenses paid trip to New York and there are two options to choose from. The company gifting you the trip can either include free of charge a loved one to accompany you on the trip or if you go alone they'll extend your trip by five days. Now I don't know about you but I can't see the point of going to New York by myself. I mean for every amazing thing I see or experience I want to be able to turn to Nicola and say, whoa, isn't this great? To me, that is immeasurably more abundant life than me standing there by myself taking selfies a thousand miles from her. Now, all that gives us a big clue as to what aspect of life truly brings abundance. Life was not made for living alone. To God, being alone is not life. Life to God is being together with. And that's why one of the commonest forms of punishment or even torture used on human beings is solitary confinement. It is the lowest form of life. Despite all the technology of our modern society, multitudes of people across the world over this last year 
have experienced some of the worst days of their lives because having food and shelter and security isn't really living if you are cut off from sharing life with the ones you love. I think we can all agree that if someone has free access to a shared life with family and friends and is then sent into isolation in a house by themselves for months on end without even knowing the physical touch of another person, we can all understand completely why they might say, this has been the worst year of my life. What they're saying is that a life of being unable to share with the ones I love isn't really living. That's not life. So, if the sweetest aspect, the real essence of life itself, the abundance of life, isn't what you do by yourself, but is found in being together with the ones you love, then I want you to have another listen to the words of Jesus. I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. In God's eyes, abundant life is only found in living a life shared with him. In God's eyes, Abundant life is only found in living a life shared with him. Jesus was saying, I have come that they may have being together with in an abundance that they've never known before. Life to God, true life, abundant life is living in his presence today. Christian, your life now is hidden with Christ and God. Your life now is in the presence of God. For only such a life can be the abundant life that Jesus came that we might have. Don't let religion rob you of that heavenly life, a life that enables you to live in the worst of circumstances on this earth and still live full of thanksgiving, for you're living in the presence of God, in that prison cell, in that failed marriage, in that sick body. You don't have to wait for that circumstance to change before you open your mouth to give thanks to God. You don't have to partake of that religious nonsense that if you only tried harder, God would be better to you. Church, enough already. Christ, your liberty, your healing, your salvation is complete in Christ and you are complete in him. Believer, your life now is completely in his presence. And in the proclamation of that truth is the power to begin living from there. So let the chains and walls that surround us shake also in this generation as they hear us proclaim this gospel to each other. You know, if this is true, if your life now is hidden with Christ and God, then you can do this today. You can turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Don't settle for Christ in heaven one day when the hope the gospel gave you was Christ in you today and you in him today. Jesus said, remain in me as I remain in you and you will bear much fruit. Your work is not to try and bear fruit by yourself, for apart from me, you can do nothing. Don't be led away from this reality of living in the presence of God by the promise of religion for a better life somewhere down the road if you only went back to the self-effort tree and tried harder to do better for God. Hear the gospel and be set free of that tree. Enough already. Christ, you're not saved by your life for God, but by his life in you. So hear the gospel of Christ and his life, not the gospel of you and your life. For in this gospel of God's grace, there is power unto salvation. And that power includes the faith to believe in him and the revelation to have a metanoia, a repentance from the Spirit of God. And repentance of the Spirit is one that goes much deeper than your superficial behavior. It goes to the root of your behavior, what you are believing. Jesus didn't come to take an ax to the branches of your life, your behaving, but take an ax to the root of your life, your believing. Are you believing that you stand in the presence of the living God? For when you believe that, you cannot live the life you were living in the darkness of self-consciousness, that selfie life. To all the promises this world of self-effort makes you of what your life might be if only you, you must answer, enough already, Christ. Because of Christ, my life now is. Now when does the world see that we really believe that our life now is? When they see us, rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. Then they see that our life now is in Christ Jesus. For according to 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18, this is God's will for us in Christ Jesus. 
You see, Jesus came to give us this life, this abundant shared life of communion with God, of living together with him, living in his presence. He came to put an end to man having to live as an I, alone and cut off from God. And God's way of dealing with the alone I is not to educate him with more information, but to bring the I life to an end. So a new I can be raised up. I with Christ. I in God. That's how the Apostle Paul could write, I am crucified with Christ. I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Now why did the old alone I have to die? Why couldn't God just give man lots more information on what God was like and how he should behave better? He did. He gave us the law and hundreds of instructions on how to live a better life. But no man ever managed to live that better life, that abundant life, except the one man, Christ Jesus, who lived in the communion of God's shared life. Because life as God intended cannot be lived apart from his shared life, his presence. You know, thank God for the technology that can make life more comfortable today. But more information does not bring life as God intended, especially if it leads us away from being together with God. I mean, even on a natural level, it has been widely observed that the very technology, I mean, the iPhones, the TVs, the Wi-Fi, that allows each person in a family, home, uh, individual access to unlimited information, that has meant that we're spending more time facing our electronic devices than facing each other. This generation of young people has become the most educated and the most lonely. God's picture of your life was never a selfie because he never saw your life as alone. He saw you with him, living in his presence. And for all who are in Christ, that is the life that now is. Now you have a choice. You can remain tied to the self-effort tree, always asking how much is enough. Or you can hear the gospel and hear your Father in Heaven's answer to that question. Enough already. Christ, the only love that is strong enough to change your behavior is the love that has never been measured out to you on the basis of your behavior. And God demonstrated that love to us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The more the church demands that people change before they will be accepted, the more the churches will empty of the very people who Jesus accepted before they changed. Church, enough already. Christ, it is his acceptance, his life flowing to us, that is the power to change us, not our willpower. For this life in Christ has not been born of the will of man, nor is it sustained by the will of man. For no man can say, Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Spirit. Receive the truth. Christ is enough already. Believe this and partake of him, the tree of life. And by receiving his life, you begin to live in this world the life that now is, the life hidden with Christ and God, the life lived in the presence of God, the abundant life that Jesus came that you might live in. God bless you. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, if you've been blessed by this and God's really spoken to you and you can think of someone who would really benefit from hearing this message, please share with them. Um, you can like us on Facebook and you can uh, subscribe to YouTube. Thank you very much and God bless.